And the first of which is what happens if DNA polymerase makes a mistake? Now, part of this we talked about last week that if DNA polymerase adds the wrong base, it won't hydrogen bond, right? The complementary nature of DNA tells us that there's only one base that can be added in for it to work properly. And so usually DNA polymerase recognizes I added the wrong base and it will back up, cut it out, and replace it. Every DNA polymerase has what we call three to five prime exonuclease activity, which basically means they can work backwards to cut out bases. Okay, DNA polymerase three can do that. DNA polymerase one can do that. As far as we know, DNA polymerase two can do that, but we didn't even talk about DNA polymerase two. Okay, that they can back up and cut out bases as they do. But only DNA polymerase one can cut out bases as it moves forward, right? Which is why DNA polymerase one, its main task is what? Cutting out the RNA primer and replacing it, okay? That was the quiz for Friday. Uh, and most of you got that, but some of you, some of you didn't. But what we're talking about here is, well, I mean, what we're gonna get to with this question is what happens if it doesn't recognize it added the wrong base? and it just keeps replicating. Next question, what if the mistake isn't fixed? Because we've got some other machinery that you'll see as we answer that first question that if DNA polymerase makes a mistake, there are other machines that can go in and fix those mistakes. But what happens if the mistakes just aren't fixed entirely? Third question, how is DNA packaged within the cell? And so this, this question will do a good job towards helping you to understand what the DNA actually looks like. And then the last one, how does prokaryotic packaging differ from that of eukaryotes? Most of what we know about DNA replication, we know from studying bacteria. Why does that make sense? Give me some reasons why most of what we know about how genetics work comes from studying bacteria. Allison. Yeah, I mean, they replicate like crazy, very short generation times. Chris? Is it because their um, DNA or RNA chain is a lot smaller than ours? Yeah, their chromosomes are much, much smaller than eukaryotic chromosomes. Mika? Sure, I mean, they have less, less machinery involved. Yeah, Adam? Yeah, nobody really gets upset about you doing genetic tests on bacteria. And then there's one other big reason. They're cheap. They're really inexpensive. Do you know where you get E. coli? You take a swab of your arm and then plate it out, and now you have E. coli to do work with. They're very, very inexpensive to procure. And so that's where most of what we know uh, about DNA replication comes from studying uh, prokaryotes. But there are some unique differences that we need to talk about. All right, first question. What happens if DNA polymerase makes a mistake? What happens if DNA uh, polymerase makes a mistake? I, I mentioned this uh, in, in, our, in our slide of all the questions, but while DNA polymerase can only attach new nucleotides at the three prime end, that is, it can only write in what direction? Five to three. It can only write in five to three. It can move, it can remove nucleotides, uh, some, at least DNA polymerase one, in either direction. And so most of the mistakes DNA polymerase makes, it's going to catch itself, again, because it added something that won't hydrogen bond. It creates a bit of a speed bump, slows the machinery down, and so it backs up, cuts it out, and puts the right base in. All while replicating about 1,000 bases a second. Okay. Recognizing mistakes, backing up, and, and fixing them. We call this three prime to five prime exonuclease activity exonuclease activity. And so here's a third domain that you should expect to find in DNA polymerase, right? The ability to actually cut these bases out as it, as it moves backwards. Yeah, Chris. And this is DNA polymerase three. That's DNA polymerase three has three prime to five prime exonuclease. DNA polymerase one has three prime to five prime. DNA polymerase two, which we didn't even talk about. DNA polymerase two exists to replicate a damaged chromosome because DNA polymerase one and three won't, won't replicate a damaged chromosome, but DNA polymerase two will. So in, in bacteria that have accumulated mutations and have damages, 
DNA polymerase II will replicate those. All of our DNA polymerases, as far as we know, have this ability to move backwards and cut nucleotides out as they do. Only DNA polymerase I can cut them out as it moves forward, which is why it's required to remove that RNA primer and replace it with DNA nucleotides. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, if it made a mistake. No, it, it, it usually doesn't miss one. It just made a mistake. It, it put the wrong base in. Yeah, put the wrong base in. That's a good question. Now, most of the mistakes that DNA polymerase does not catch will get cut out by what we call DNA repair mechanisms. And so what they'll do is they'll, they'll find where you've got this bulge, right? If you add the wrong base, you're going to have a bulge in your DNA molecule. Instead of being a normal double helix that gets that nice, clean twist, you end up with a bulge. It ends up with just this big, bulky section in the DNA molecule. The DNA mismatch machinery will recognize that, will cut out bases on either side, and then recruit DNA polymerase to come back in and do it right. Okay? And so you have, again, they're called mismatch repair mechanisms or DNA repair mechanisms. And there are different machines that will come in, will cut out one of the strands, and then recruit DNA polymerase to come back and do it right. So DNA polymerase catches greater than 99% of the mistakes it makes. It catches itself, backs up, it fixes them. So of the less than 1% of the mistakes DNA polymerase makes persist to the next round, and then these DNA repair mechanisms catch over 99% of those mistakes. And that's why in a given gene in your body, there's one mutation in that gene every 10,000 generations in a single gene. One gene mutates about once every 10,000 generations. How many genes do we have in our genome, though? Anyone know? We haven't talked about this yet. About 25,000. So if the, the probability of mutation in every one single gene is 1 in 10,000, and you've got 25,000 genes, how many new mutations did you accumulate during your lifetime? 2.5, right? 1 in 10,000, 25,000 genes. So in your entire genome, in all of your genes, okay, which is only a portion of your genome, you're going to accumulate about two and a half mutations in your genes during your lifetime. Okay? Now, not all of those will be passed on. Some of them may. But it's just, I mean, it's just, for me, it, I think that's incredible to know that these can be writing a thousand bases a second, can be replicating your cells and some of your tissues like crazy, generating millions of new cells every day, and to have you accumulate about two and a half mutations during your lifetime in your genes. I mean, that's, that's pretty incredible. All right, so here's the process of DNA polymerase uh, working. So here DNA polymerase is just trucking along, reading the template strand, adding new nucleotides at the three prime end. So writing in what direction? Right. Five prime to three prime, in this case, moving to the right. And then here it added what should have been a T, but it added the wrong pyrimidine. You see that? It added a C instead of a T. Okay, they will not hydrogen bond, so it creates this bulge. It'll recognize that bulge, move backwards, cut out that error, and then replace it with the proper base with the T. And again, DNA polymerase catches greater than 99% of the mistakes that it makes. If it doesn't, you have this persistent issue here you add a T on the template strand. It should have been a C, it should have been a A, right? It should have been an A base that was added there, but instead it added the wrong purine. It added guanine. They will not hydrogen bond. This bulge persists. The DNA repair mechanisms or mismatch repair mechanisms will recognize the error here. Will come in, cut on both sides of that error, physically pull that section out and then recruit DNA polymerase to come in and rewrite that section. Okay, and then ligase will come in and fix that nick just like it does during our normal DNA replication. Yeah, Chris? So those DNA repair mechanisms that, for this case, is not the polymerase yet? No, no, well, the polymerase is still involved. Okay. Whether the DNA polymerase caught the mistake itself or this DNA repair mechanism, the mismatch repair, caught the mistake. DNA polymerase still has to be involved because it's the only uh, machine that we have that actually writes new strands of DNA, right? 
So if you cut out the error, you still need to recruit DNA polymerase because it's the only machine that can write a new strand. It just now had to write it a second time. Yeah. That's a good question. All right. So you, are you getting a sense that errors are very rare? Errors are very rare. At least these types of errors. What's... We'll talk, probably not in this class, but when you get into genetics, errors that are much less rare. But they're, for, they're not copying errors. They're, they're other types of errors. All right, so the next question we have, well, what if neither DNA polymerase nor the DNA repair mechanisms recognize that there's an issue? Right? That, that, that mistaken base ends up persisting. We call these copy errors mutations. Right, those that persist, they make it through the uh, error checking of both DNA polymerase and the DNA repair mechanisms. And, and they persist. They persist as mutations. These, what we call point mutations, a mutation at a single point in the DNA, uh, lead to some of the variation in, in living organisms. We've talked about 23andMe. Uh, a few times and, and some of the other companies where you can send your, your DNA, what they do is they use sections in the genome where there's variability, where I may have an A there, you may have a T or a G or a C, and so there's some variation, and they use that to try to determine your ancestry, right? So what do people from this region tend to have in that position, right? And if people from this region tend to have a T, that if you have a T, they predict that you're from that region. You know, like, it seems like there's a lot of error in that. There is, but when you're talking about 10 to 15 million of these regions in the genome, that you all, based on what, you, you can get some pretty good confidence in predicting somebody's uh, genetic heritage. Did I tell you you can also do this for your dog? So they have kits where you can take a, a swab of the inside of your dog's mouth and mail it in, and they'll match it to breeds, doing the, basically the same thing that you would do to try to match humans to particular regions of the world. That's cool stuff. Costs about $85. I, I know I told you this, because I told you if you wanted to know something you can get me as a gift for my birthday. Did I tell you this? Oh, if you wanted to know what you could get me as a gift for my birthday, I would, I would love one of those. But my birthday is not during this semester, so it's really irrelevant to you. All right. So now, if, if a point mutation is in a particular portion of the DNA, the mutation can be devastating. And what part of the DNA, if you have a point mutation, would be most likely to result in something that could be catastrophic? How about one of those 25,000 genes in our genome? Right? I just mentioned to you maybe five minutes ago that we've got about 25,000 genes in our genome. If the point mutation happens there, it can be devastating because it can result in either a mutant protein or uh, just a, a, a protein that never gets made. Okay, and we'll talk more about this in the coming weeks. All right, so what are some other sources of variation? Oh, Mika, sorry. You mean like missense, nonsense? We will talk about those eventually. Not right now. Yeah, that's a good question. We will talk about those eventually. Okay, what are some other sources of variation? So we've, we've got a mutation that happens as a result of copying errors. What are some other sources of variation? There are ways to change the DNA other than by making a copying error. Have you heard of mutagens? or carcinogens, you heard that term? It refers to something that spontaneously changes the de genome. It doesn't lead to an issue in copying errors, it, it actually changes it while it's in its normal condition, okay? And so there are carcinogens that can do that. And then we talked about a mechanism of switching genetic material in prokaryotes that also happens in eukaryotes, and it changes the genome, what was it? Not transformation, but tra that's good. That's, you're, going, you're in the right direction. Transformation only happens in prokaryotes as they take on external DNA. Transduction, where a virus is involved, right? 
and a virus injects genetic material into its host, that's another source of variation in genomes. And uh, probably in the last 30 or 40 years, uh, we've started to really look at viral infections as a source of the mutations that trigger certain genetic illnesses, especially cancers. Okay, so I'm gonna show you uh, some interesting uh, mutations and then we'll take our lecture break. So here's albinism. And so this is a single point mutation. It's a, it's a single change in the sequence for making the pigment. And now you, ca you, can't, you either can't make pigment or in a separate gene, you can't deposit it even if you can make it. And so you get albinism, the complete absence of pigment. <laughs> Raccoons don't care. Most, most animals, um, they, they, they care a whole lot. Raccoons, they're, they're very friendly. Uh, towards other raccoons, not, not towards people. Uh, here is a, a panther. It's a melanistic jaguar or melanistic leopard. Either way, you basically get the same thing. And again, it's, it's a single point mutation that erases the, the patterns of pigmentation. Typically, your patterns of pigmentation give you those spots. And here, you just deposit pigment everywhere. Okay, So it's, it's just a leopard or a jaguar, but it's just deposited pigment everywhere. polydactyly, and so here the, the, the creation of extra digits, get a single point mutation. Sickle cell anemia, a single point mutation in one of the proteins in hemoglobin that then leads to a, a sickle shape uh, in, the, in the red blood cells and has uh, a, an enormous variety of, of phenotypic outcomes. Okay. So what I want you to do is this. So I, I, I told you, we, we talked specifically about copying errors and how that can fuel mutations. And then we talked about mutagens or carcinogens and how they can lead to changes in the genome. And we talked about viruses and how they can insert DNA and lead to changes in the genome. And so what I want you to do is this. I want you to uh, basically propose some mechanisms by which we can catch errors that aren't copy errors, right? Because copy errors, DNA polymerase can catch those, yes? And does greater than 99% of them. Those that DNA polymerase doesn't catch, over 99% of them will be caught by our DNA repair mechanism. But what about our other two? DNA errors that are a result of a carcinogen or mutagen, or DNA errors that are a result of a virus in inserting its, its genetic material into the host genome. What are some mechanisms that you might propose to protect against those, those types of, of genetic changes, all right? And again, we, we haven't talked about this yet, so it's, it's going to be all just based on what you think you need to look for if you have one of those changes, okay? Take about 90 seconds, talk with those around you, and, and come up with a proposed mechanism to check for those types of changes, all right? 90 seconds. Starting now. <laughs> Are there not markers? 
No, I mean it's 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 normal DNA. Yeah. All right. So we had a question from here, which really the answer to this question has a huge implication on what you might predict. Uh, they asked, is there any way, is there any kind of a marker on viral DNA when it's inserted into the host genome that would designate it viral? And there's really not. We talked, we talked a little bit about this, but you have two types of virus, two different types of retroviruses that basically they, along with their genetic material, insert a protein that's called reverse transcriptase that takes the viral nucleic acid and writes it backwards into host DNA. And then you have machines in your, in your nucleus that recognize fragments of DNA and say that's not normal and then put it into the chromosome somewhere. And so there's really no way, there's no marker that says this is viral DNA. Now we can do analyses and, and we can search our genome for sequences that are similar to human viruses, and then we can find those, but the machinery in your cell don't recognize, they, they don't recognize it, it as being any different. Yeah, Peyton. Would there be something with the white blood cells attacking the virus and stuff like that, where they would either come and destroy it, or is there something else where the body would then isolate that to keep it from spreading? Yes. Yeah, so, so there, there are several changes that happen to a host cell when it's infected by a virus. If it's infected by an active virus that, that's lytic, right, because you've got the lytic phase and the lysogenic, if it's infected by a virus that's actively lytic or lytic, uh, there are certain changes that start to happen to the cell as it stops making enough of its own product because it's busy making viral product, right? And so there are red blood or white blood cells that can recognize some of those changes and they'll just eat the cell. They recognize that there's something wrong with the cell. They'll eat the cell and destroy it, destroying any viruses that are inside. Yeah, yeah. So lytic. Lytic, yeah. All right, let's think about this. How many copies of each chromosome do you have in your cells normally? We've talked about this several times. Well, so you've got 23 chromosomes and two versions of each, right? If you're male, your 23rd set is one X chromosome and one Y, right? And then if, if you're female, your 23rd set is two X chromosomes. But you've got 23 pairs, yes? We've talked about this, okay? So you've got one that came from your mom and one that came from your dad for each of those 23 chromosomes. How likely is it, do you think that you would get the same mutation in the same spot on both sets of those chromosomes. It's probably not very likely at all, which means a great mechanism to check for these type of errors would be to compare the two copies of chromosome one to each other, right? So you don't need to know all the ways it can go wrong. You just need to know what a right version looks like. Right? If you know what the right version of chromosome 1 looks like, and you're like, how does the cell know which one is right? And it, it doesn't, but if the two are different, it won't go through the cell cycle often. It won't replicate itself. It won't allow it to. It fails what's called the checkpoint. We'll talk more about this in a, maybe next week, but probably the week after, where you have certain checkpoints that you have to pass to move through portions of the cell cycle that you have to pass to even get to start to replicate the DNA. Because if every cell in your body has two copies of every chromosome, one that came from your mom and one that came from your dad, when you replicate that DNA, now those cells have how many copies? Four, right? Two of them that came from your mom, right? One and then the, the copy. But you're like, no, it's semi-conservative, Dr. Engel. Both have one old and one new strand. You're right. And then two that are basically your paternal copy of that chromosome. Before the cell will do that, it checks the, to make sure that the two chromosomes are the same. And if they aren't, it won't replicate. And you're like, well, how does that work exactly? Because my mom and my dad are different, right? Right? Your mom and your dad are not identical twins. So there are going to be differences in their genome. 
You're like, well, so it has to allow for certain differences. Yes, but there are certain parts of the chromosome where there should not be differences. And there are machines that will check for that. And if there are differences in places where there should not be, it won't replicate the DNA. It won't continue through the cell cycle. And it's so cool. And then you're like, well, Dr. Engel, what if the mutation is in one of the machines that codes for checking for those errors? Now you have a problem, right? And this is where you get genetic mutations that will actually perpetuate and will, the cells will replicate and you oftentimes get uncontrolled cell growth. If your mutation, the difference is, is in the machine that looks for those differences. But we'll get there in a couple weeks. Does that make sense? Okay, so oftentimes copy errors make up a very small percentage of the mutation, total mutations because it's very unlikely to have a copying error. Most of the mutations are the result of some environmental factor. Environmental factor, some mutagen or carcinogen uh, or a viral, um, a viral transduction. Yeah, Chris. So just, just so I can make sense, like, so we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Yes. So we have two, uh, two chromosome ones, two yes. chromosome twos, and yep. exact, they should be exact. Every cell in your body except red blood cells because they lack nuclei, right? Mm -hmm. um, there seems to be some evidence that some uh, neurons actually lack one of the sets of some of the chromosomes, but that we, we, we don't know for sure. And then your, your gametes. Okay. So your gametes only have one copy of the genome because they need to be a cell that fuses with a gamete from somebody else that has one copy. And when they fuse together, you get the normal condition of two copies of the genome. Okay. But other than that, every cell in your body has, has two copies okay. of every chromosome. Two chromosome ones, one that came from your mom, one that came from your dad. Two chromosome twos, one that came from your mom, one that came from your dad. Two chromosome threes, so on all the way up to chromosome 22. And then chromosome 23 is the sex chromosome. And then if you're, if you're female, you've got two X chromosomes, one that came from your mom, one that came from your dad. If you're male, you've got an X chromosome that came from mom and a Y chromosome that came from dad. So if I have, since I have two, one chromosome, like, chromosome one or whatever, and I have uh -huh. two of them, one's from my mom, one's from yes. my dad. So they're not identical? Correct, completely. but there are parts of chromosome one that uh, have to be identical. Oh, okay. Yep. So there are parts that are going to be different, right? Unless your mom and your dad are identical twins, okay. which works in some animals, but they have what's, anyways, but it doesn't, it doesn't work for humans, yeah. What if some of like, the mutations are in like, those parts with the different? Like, will the, cell be, or will the machine still be able to detect or not? If the mutations, I'm sorry? Are occurring in the parts of the chromosome where it's different from, like... Oh, yeah, where it already isn't reading because there are already differences. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's some cushion for mutations to not get recognized, right? Because they, they should be different, right? Uh, so, for instance, let, let's go, like, a gene, a gene that, that varies a lot from person to person. So the gene that codes for a protein called eumelanin, which is a pigment protein... There's a, there's a great deal of variation from person to person. And so that would be one where you could accumulate mutations and they're probably, the machinery probably wouldn't pick it up because it's already used to the two versions of chromosome one being different there. Yeah, David. What about the, the last one, the 23rd? The 23rd? Yeah, could there be room for mutation errors? Oh, yeah, yep, absolutely. At least in the region, so there's a region of chromosome Y that corresponds significantly with chromosome X that gets them to associate together. But the rest of chromosome Y is unique. The rest of chromosome Y, it's called the SRY region. And we'll talk more about this in a few weeks. But it basically has a, a few dozen different genes that lead to the genetic changes that produce male mammals. And so those genes are not found on the X chromosome. They're unique. Yeah, so there's really nothing to compare them to. Yeah. All right. So how is DNA packaged within the cell? So we've already talked about that the process of replicating DNA is very highly controlled. There are a lot of machines to check to make sure it's done properly. But what happened with this? These should both be capitalized. That's not like a different type of DNA. Um, the structure and the organization of DNA is also very highly controlled. We'll see this a lot on Wednesday and next week as we start talking about, okay, Cool, we could replicate the DNA, but what else do we do with it? What does it do? 
So in eukaryotic cells, uh, DNA is, is packaged as what we call chromatin. And chromatin is a composite structure of DNA and a bunch of different types of proteins. One of these protein types is called histones. And basically the DNA is wrapped around these histones and is attracted to them based on ionic bonds. DNA is negatively charged <clears throat> and these histones are positively charged. And positively charged materials bond with negatively charged materials because of an attraction and the difference in, in charges. And so the DNA is actually physically wrapped around these histones, okay, to condense the DNA a bit. Yeah, so Micah. Last week when you were using it, you mean tenderizers and break the protein? Yes, it's exactly what you were doing. Yeah, so last week when we isolated the DNA and got it to precipitate out of solution, for those of you that, you know, waited till the cloud formed and didn't just like, oh, cool, the cloud's there and dump your stuff out. Um, but the meat tenderizer, what it did was destroyed these proteins that the DNA is wrapped around. Okay? In every cell in your body, you've got about six feet of DNA if you just if you allowed it to stretch out to its full length. But it's, it's, it's not packaged that way. It's wrapped around proteins inside of your cells. And so what we were doing with the meat tender, is exactly right, Michael. We were destroying those proteins that it's wrapped around. The proteins aren't there. It can't be wrapped around proteins because they're not there, right? Okay, so these histones are formed, they are a protein octamer, which means it's a protein that has quaternary structure and how many different polypeptides combine to form an octamer? Eight. Okay, so these histones are a protein with quaternary structure and it's got eight proteins. Two copies each of histone 2A, histone 2B, histone 3, and histone 4 to form this big, what looks like a bead that DNA wraps around. And so when DNA is this, in this form, which is the typical form for DNA, it looks like beads on a string. And so we call it beads on a string. <laughs> and it's the normal structure of DNA. DNA wrapped around these histones. Now, if you want to package them even further, we can add in another protein called H1 or histone 1. And what it does is it will take several of these beads, usually six of them, and wrap all six beads up together into a big solenoid, like a, a column. Looks like a barrel. And so this is a way to further condense the DNA down. We'll see next week and the week after and the week after that times in which you want to really condense that DNA down. You just want to really pack it in tight. All right, so then we have a question. Well, how can the DNA be replicated if it's packed so tightly, right? Because when we talked about replication, what are some of the proteins involved in replication and what do they do? Somebody give me some of those proteins. DNA polymerase, and what it does is it reads the template strand and writes the new one. Good. What are some other proteins? Helicase. Helicase gets in and breaks the hydrogen bonds between the strands. Good. What else? Ligase, Ligase comes in and fix those nicks left over when polymerase is done. Right? Polymerase finishes the activity and it leaves a mess. Like somebody that cooked dinner and then just left a mess everywhere. But you appreciate it because they made dinner, right? You're like, I'll clean up. I got you. I don't think Ligase is disappointed by its job. Okay, what else? Primase. primase, right? That writes that RNA primer. It can start the process so DNA polymerase can take over. And you're like, cool, but all of those require access to the DNA. And if the DNA is wrapped around the proteins, how do you access it? That's a wonderful question. You don't until you unwrap it. And so if you're going to replicate the DNA, you actually have to unwrap it from around that histone from around that nucleosome. You've got to unwrap the DNA so that helicase can break the two strands apart. So that DNA polymerase can read it and write the new strand. So that ligase can fix the mess left over after DNA polymerase is done. And so we have within the chromosome basically two different forms of, of chromatin. You've got euchromatin that are basically just wrapped around those nucleosomes and you can access it, you just have to unwrap it. But there are machines 
that are part of the replication process too that we didn't talk about that actually unwrap it from the from the, the, the histone. But then there are forms of DNA that are so packedly tight together, so packedly tight together, what is it? So tightly packed together that you're not only wrapping it around histones, but you've taken six histones and wrapped them around a single H1, and then sometimes there we've taken those solenoids and, and wrap them around what are called histone-like proteins to form big loops. And it's so tightly condensed that you can't access it at all. You can't replicate it. You can't get access to any of that code and do anything with it. And you're like, that's so cool. But why on earth would we ever want to do that? Why would you want to package DNA so tightly that you can't do anything with it? And you are fully equipped now to answer or to give one scenario in which you want that to happen. Yeah, Micah. Oh, uh, that, I mean, that's gonna be a benefit of it. But if male mammals have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome, and female mammals have two X chromosomes, it seems like you're gonna have an issue, right? Because males don't need two X chromosomes. Meaning you don't need two X chromosomes, and having two might be a big problem. Right? Because you're going to lead to overexpression of something. So what you find in mammals is one of the X chromosomes gets permanently shut down. It gets converted into this, heterochromatin. We'll see this again in a couple of weeks. So you can't access any of the material on there. And it's so cool. I'll give, this is bonus information for now, but it won't be for long. There's one gene on that X chromosome that codes for an RNA that then like hugs the chromosome. It just, it just hugs that chromosome and recruits machinery to, 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 to pack it so tightly that you can't, you can't get to it. Yeah. Identical twins? Yeah. Except for those that they accumulate during their lifetime. So, like, so you're going <laughs> to, you're going to start life with, yes, you'll start life with uh, identical genomes. But even, so the most, the place where you get the most mutations from copying errors happens in utero. When you are growing and dividing at, at a faster rate than at any other point in your life, that's where you get most of the copying errors that happen. And so by the time that you are born, you are actually no longer genetically identical to your twin. <clears throat> not perfectly. <laughs> I mean, not perfectly. Yeah, hypothetically, if you had an identical twin, oh. right? You, you do have an identical twin, right? Yeah. Um, by the time that you are born, you are no longer perfectly identical twins anymore. Now, you're pretty close. I mean, really close. Uh, but that, uh, that actually helps to explain some of the minor differences that you can see between identical twins, right? There, there, are, some, there are some differences that if you know them well enough, you, you notice, right? Some of them are behavioral, some of them are physical. Right. Okay, so here's, uh, here's the beads on a string. Look at this. You see that? The histones with DNA wrapped around it looks like beads on a string. And then here we take these and we wrap six histones around H1 and form this big column of DNA, this barrel called a solenoid. And then we can take that and we can condense it down further by looping it all around and there are just ways that we can make this DNA so densely packed that you would have no hope of actually accessing it. And so densely packed that you can actually see a single molecule or a, like a single piece of DNA under very, very minimal magnification. Yeah, David. So where's the DNA? This right here is the DNA. You see that oh. if you, it's showing you the double helix. That's, that's the DNA molecule right there. All right, so last question. How does prokaryotic packaging differ from that of eukaryotes? Okay, first point. Prokaryotes have far fewer proteins associated with the DNA than eukaryotes do. Notice what it did not say. It did not say that prokaryotes have no proteins associated with the DNA, right? It just said that they have fewer than eukaryotes. 
Although you do still have some proteins associated with it to condense it a little bit. But part of this, did you, was it you that said that prokaryotic genomes, they're so much smaller than eukaryotes? Yeah, I mean, we don't have to package it as tightly because it's, it's so much smaller. I think the average E. coli genome is like 10,000 bases. For some reason, that number is in my, in my mind. I don't know if that's actually true. But our genome is 4 billion bases, and you've got two copies of it in virtually every cell in your body. Okay? Much, it's, it's just a completely different um, a, amount of DNA and a completely different challenge. Also, bacterial chromosomes tend to be circular, and they're not packaged into a nucleus. Okay? They tend to be circular, and uh, they're suspended in the cytoplasm. And so uh, what that means is that there are certain proteins that are associated inside the eukaryotic nucleus that, that you should not expect to find in prokaryotes because there's no way to compartmentalize where the DNA is from everywhere else. Right? We talked about a big function of membranes is to create compartments, right? chemically distinct compartments within the cell. But if you don't have a nucleus, you don't have any membranes within the cell, you shouldn't expect to find that. Right? Okay. Replication happens at a single origin. In eukaryotes, you have multiple origins of replication on every chromosome. But in a prokaryotic genome, replication starts at a single place, and the two forks move in opposite directions until they meet on the other side of the chromosome. And we'll see this. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll, I'll spend some time today in lab uh, showing you uh, how that works. On top of that, uh, many uh, bacterial cells, probably most bacterial cells, in addition to their main chromosome, have pieces of DNA called plasmids. And where did they get those? They may go have got them from viruses through transduction. They may have got them through transformation by taking them on just from the environment, or they may have been giving them, given them through a pillus from another bacterium. Through what process? Conjugation. 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 All right. So here's a replication of a bacterial genome. So we've got a single circular chromosome. Replication starts at a single origin of replication where you've got DNA A comes in, breaks the initial bonds, then helicase comes in and starts breaking the hydrogen bonds around this way, right? You've got another helicase on this side of the bubble breaking bonds around this way, right? And what's attached to helicase on either side? Two molecules of DNA polymerase, specifically DNA polymerase three, and it's just going around. Now it's it's copying one strand continuously and the other one discontinuously, but the machine just keeps on moving all the way until it meets up here and the other fork reaches that point as well. And then at that point, your chromosome has been completely duplicated where each of the two new molecules has one old strand and one new strand. And now you've got two copies of the genome that when that cell divides into two cells, each cell gets one copy. David. So does the polar Polymerase? Polymerase move around the DNA strand? Yes, it moves along with helicase. Yep. Okay. Yep. Although it's really a matter of perspective, right? Because you could say the machine doesn't move and the chromosome moves, yeah. or the chromosome doesn't move and the machine moves, right? It's really just like a point of reference. Okay. You know? Like, so somebody that's running, you could say that you're standing still and they're moving away from you, or you can say, you know, they're standing still and you're moving away from them while not exerting any energy to do so, right? It's just a matter of perspective. Yeah, matter of perspective. Okay. Any questions, thoughts, concerns? Okay. We've got, uh, we've got a little bit of time, but not enough time to really make a dent on Chapter 15. So we're actually going to we'll, we'll end class here um, on Wednesday. Uh, we will get into chapter 15, and, 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 and we're going to get into chapter 15. And, and you, you may or may not have noticed this on the study guide, but there is a question from chapter 15 on the study guide. And then the quiz that we'll, I'll post tonight for Wednesday will be on chapter 15. Pay particularly close attention 
to the essay question on that quiz. Okay? I mean, particularly close attention. Get to know that question. The one on Wednesday, right? The one on Wednesday. Yeah, it's not posted yet. Yeah, get to know that question. Yeah, real well. 